Greetings, Fizzles family and friends. This is the daily pastoral message for Saturday, May 23rd. And this being Saturday, we're coming again in our Saturday series of readings from the Jesus Diaries, Who Jesus Is to Me, written by members of the United Church of Christ Still Speaking Writers Group. Today's passage is from Ron Buford, who was formerly with the UCC National Staff and was the coordinator the coordinator of the God is Still Speaking campaign of the UCC. And he went back to pastoring after he left the national office and is now the pastor of the Sunnydale Community Church, United Church of Christ in Sunnydale, California. His selection, his Who Jesus Is to Me story, is called, is entitled, there's something about Jesus. Immediately after delivering a sermon, a dear friend and colleague gently offered me some feedback. Consider talking less about Jesus, he said. Less about Jesus, but bubbling up within me as I walked away. More about Jesus, let me learn. More of his holy will discern. More of his saving fullness see. More of his love who died for me. As a black man in America, I have not only needed Jesus for as long as I can remember, I need Jesus now more than ever. When I die, I hope my last breath will gently whisper that sweet name, Jesus. In a favorite short story by Flannery O'Connor, Hazel Motes says, Any man with a good car don't need no redemption. Though I've had good cars for a long time, being black, orphaned, and later adopted, gay and liberal in an America where such qualities can be like square pegs in round holes, there are times when my life's car does not seem to be so good. Sometimes it seems filled and weighted down with excess baggage, some of it my own, some of it thrown in by others. So I need redemption every day. Working in Europe for a couple of years where I rarely encountered many of these issues, especially the racism, my load seemed lighter, but not totally. Job, the ancient biblical character, was right. We humans are, indeed, of a few days and full of trouble. Whether Job meant the days of our life or our human nature is unclear, but both are true. I've learned that every day, from the White House to the Poor House, has some trouble, and when it's your trouble, it's real. And so there's this Jesus, the great mystery, fully human and fully divine. One would think that you could not have it better than that, wouldn't you? But even Jesus had trouble. In Jesus' darkest hour, his closest friends distanced themselves. Mary, like any modern mother at a son's death penalty hearing, stood alone at Jesus' execution, along with the disciple Jesus loved. Even Thomas Jefferson suggests that <clears throat> Among Jesus' contemporaries, Jesus must have been just one more lower-class person born out of wedlock, a despised outsider of questionable paternity. Is it any wonder that when Jesus stood to read scripture in his hometown, some scoffed sarcastically, Is this not Joseph's son? But dipping into that deep well of life's joys and sorrows, Jesus drew up compassion, not bitterness connecting with people who faced such challenges, trading redemption for their sorrows. Jesus' example and teaching continually make the offer I simply cannot refuse. Come to me, all who labor and are heavily weighed down. I will give you rest. Take my yoke and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and you will find rest for your soul. In the church of my childhood, a so-called portrait of Jesus hung in the front of the church. 
Jesus, blonde and blue-eyed, sat up at a table with hands folded and eyes that seemed to follow you. Why did this not seem strange in a room entirely filled with middle-class and working-class black people? What does it say about the way we view Jesus and ourselves? What took us so long to take it down? Most important, what does it say about Jesus that he can transcend such miscasting? I never thought about any of these questions until age 14. I heard theologian James Cone speak about the pretty blonde Jesus who would not survive in many black neighborhoods. Or would he? Perhaps the more important question is why this Jesus has survived so well for so long in African-American communities as well as communities in Africa, the Pacific, Central and South America, Eastern Asia, and elsewhere where Jesus is equally miscast. What is it about a living Jesus who defies the limits of cultural packaging? Of such, with such images in mind, why do so many from opp oppressed communities fervently sing, Pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry, while on others you are calling, do not pass me by. And others wonder, what's the big deal about Jesus for you people? I am forever changed by the public reaction to the still to the God is still speaking television ad that featured bouncers working a velvet rope line outside a church. The bouncers admitted all the, quote, right people and turned away others who didn't seem to fit the profile. The tagline said it all. Jesus didn't turn people away, and neither do we, the United Church of Christ. Many found the ad troubling. But those who are sometimes treated as outsiders received it as good news. Parents of children with autism, the divorced, interfaith couples whose babies were deemed unfit to baptize, the LGBTQ, those living with HIV AIDS, women seeking ordination, registered sex offenders, people living together who for a variety of reasons chose not to marry the many more who loved these people, and so many more. They were all desperate to find this hidden Jesus who would not turn them away, no matter who they were or where they were on life's journey. In the end, it mattered less whether or not Jesus was blonde and blue-eyed, woolly-haired and olive-skinned, or coarse-haired and black as coal. The only question that mattered to thousands was, is it true that your Jesus loves me and won't turn me away as I've experienced in the past? Those of us who had felt turned away by God and the church, to those who felt turned away by God and the church, this was unbelievably good news. At first, it was hard for me to believe and sometimes I still regress. So whenever I receive communion, I imagine receiving it from the hands of Jesus himself. Then I imagine asking Jesus each time if it's true that he will take me just as I am, with all my flaws, all my woundedness. Is it true he can make my life a blessing? In song comes the only answer. Let not fitness make you linger, nor of fitness fondly dream. All of fitness God requires is to feel your need of God. And reaching for the bread and wine with joy. I will arise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms, in the arms of my dear Savior, 
O, oh, there are ten thousand charms. In that moment, with the full affirmation of a welcoming community, and along with saints past, present, and those yet to come, we gather in Jesus' name. In that sweet moment, past rejections and hurts, fears and lingering doubts, sin and alienation, shortcomings and failures are powerless before that living water mysteriously springing up within my thirsting soul. And I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is alive. I thank God there's something about Jesus. Jesus. I thank Ron Buford, who I have met uh, at a symposium in Chicago uh, and met him in passing at General Synods. He's a wonderful, kind man, and I thank him for his thoughts in his selection here today. The pause that we had near the end was because even though the first two songs are songs that I sang often at Kenwood, uh, they're songs that were part of Kenwood's regular repertoire, uh, the uh, last song I had not sung, and so I was teaching it to myself and thought I needed to go brush up with the camera on pause before trying to sing it on video. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty song. It's a haunting song. But the message of the song is we don't need, you know, we don't, we don't need to linger on our shortcomings. We, we don't need to linger on whether we are fit enough because all that God desires is for us to desire God. All Jesus wants is for us to seek him, to receive his love so that we can love him in return and love others. And so that is who Jesus is to Ron Buford. And hopefully you heard some notes there, whether musical or idea notes that resonated in your soul about who Jesus is to you, because there is something about that name. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the love that you have shown us, a love that is radically inclusive, for you call us to come to you, to give our burdens over to you, that you can help us to find rest in you, no matter who we are or where we are on life's journey. And so, Lord, we thank you for your radically inclusive love. We thank you for the redemption that you give us through that love and the salvation that we find in you, O God, through you, O Christ. Lord, continue to love us every day and lead us in the paths of discipleship, the paths of love, the paths of service, the paths of caring that you have blazed before us. Keep us mindful of all those suffering in this pandemic. Help them, O oh Lord, through their times and help us as well, for we know troubles too, as you, Jesus, did as well. And so, Lord, we just thank you and give you praise, honor, and glory. There is something about that name, Jesus. Amen. I look forward to worshiping on the video with you on Sunday and then to talking with people on Sunday at 11 in our Zoom gathering. Have a wonderful and safe holiday weekend as it's beginning yesterday and continuing today, tomorrow, and Monday. And remember to always pray to God for strength and to receive God's love. And stay safe, stay healthy, stay strong, and know that God continues to bless us all. Goodbye for now.